This is the true story of Sally Ann Bowman, a kind and extremely talented 18 year old girl. Following in the footsteps of Amy Winehouse and Adele, seemingly destined for huge success in the entertainment industry, but after an argument with her boyfriend, she never made it home. Where and who would authorities look to for answers? Not where you'd expect. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Sally Ann and all those affected by this case. Sally Ann Bowman was born on October the 5th, 1987 in Swindon. A star in the making, she was known for her warm personality and infectious smile. It was said she could light up any room she walked into. Bright and bubbly, Sally Ann loved the stage and performing for audiences. She could sing, she could dance, and she was accepted into the Brit School, a prestigious school for the performing arts. A school known for producing such stars as Adele and Amy Winehouse, Sally Ann was well on her way to hitting the big time, achieving her dreams. Standing at six feet tall with a slender frame and classically beautiful features, Sally Ann was also at the start of a successful modelling career. Even at the tender age of 18, when many of us have no idea what we want to do with our lives, she truly had everything going for her. She was um, um, mainly in theatre at college at the start. And um, then she was doing dance, so she could act, she could dance, and as well as this, she could sing. Like I never knew, while well, I was at Brit School for the two years she was there, I never knew that she could sing so well. And then one day I went to her house and she got a karaoke machine out and I just remember her singing Stand By Your Man. Sally's family was the centre of her world and she cherished the time spent with them. But keen to get some independence, she had moved out of the family home and was renting a room in a shared house nearby. It wasn't anything grand, but it was hers and she loved having her own space. On the 24th of September 2005, Sally Ann was at her mum's house. She'd spent her day relaxing before getting ready to hit the Town with her older sister Nicole and her friends. At 6pm she headed off telling her mum she loved her as she walked down the driveway. Not wanting to travel into London, the women decided to spend their evening on Croydon High Street at Lloyd's Bar. It was a girls night and they were letting their hair down. They were dancing, drinking and laughing. By 1am, Sally Ann and her friends were all partied out. Just a quick note from me, the thought of partying for 7 hours now makes me realise how old I am. I actually can't imagine being able to do that. But back to the case. Jumping in a taxi, they headed back to Sally Ann's sister's house. But Sally Ann wasn't in the mood for an after party. She had gone through a breakup recently and it was playing on her mind. She'd been dating Lewis Sproston for two years on and off and the two had called it quits a few weeks earlier. Soon after arriving, Sally Ann phoned Lewis who was out in Kingston with his mates. She wasn't over him yet and invented a bogus story to get his attention. She told him that sister Nicole had been arrested for fighting and she asked him for a lift home. He wasn't happy about leaving his friends but he couldn't leave her stranded. He picked her up in his car at around 2.20am and began to drive her back towards Blenheim Avenue where she rented her room. With a breakup fresh, emotions were running high. Quickly, the pair started bickering in the car. They argued about their relationship ending, both accusing each other of cheating. It was heated. 
This really is young love in action. The argument lasted for around two hours and for Lewis, it's forever stamped in his memory. He said, I thought she had been with boys at night and she thought I'd been with girls. It was just jealousy. There may have been raised voices but not shouting. Nobody outside of the car would have heard it. We then made up, hugging and kissing. But Sally Ann didn't want me to leave and we started to argue. At around 4.15am, Sally Ann got out of the car and Lewis drove off. He didn't know that this would be the last time he would see Sally Ann. A neighbour reported being woken up by the sound of a gargled noise followed by a scream. It didn't seem right, so they got out of bed. Looking out of the window, the street was still. There was now no other noise. No one was around. So they simply went back to bed. But five minutes later, unable to shake the sound of the screams, the same neighbour returned to the window spotting a man walking down the street. But there was no one else in view. It was just one man walking, nothing untoward. They returned to bed, putting the harrowing noises down to foxes. Foxes are common in London. The next morning at around 6.30am, something caught the eye of the same neighbour. Hidden just out of view behind a skip, they saw what looked to be the legs of a mannequin. Getting closer to investigate, they were met with a truly horrific sight. They said about that morning, I put on my dressing gown and slippers and went across the road. I walked around the left side of the skip. I just felt I knew what I would see. I knelt just as a natural thing and said, Oh, poor darling. Mother Linda Bowman recalled hearing knocking at her front door. It was still early in the morning. She assumed it was Sally Ann who must have been locked out. From what I could tell, this wouldn't have been the first time. We've all been there. But in a moment that must have been confusing, but then crushing, she instead was met by three police officers. It was then that the officer told her the horrifying news. Sally Ann would not be coming home. Mother Linda remembered screaming, she recalled. Just screaming, I couldn't believe it, my whole world fell apart. Her youngest daughter had been struck with a sharp implement until she was no longer breathing. Within hours of the investigation being launched, her sister and mother were faced with a terrible ordeal of identifying her body. Speaking about the experience, Mother Linda explained that she thought it was a cruel joke at first, saying, I remember going into the room and for a split second, I thought it wasn't her because her hair was dark. And I just moved forward and saw her little button nose and freckles and knew that was it. Two days after Sally Ann had been found, the family made the decision to learn more about what had happened. Stuart Cundy, the senior investigating officer, arrived at Linda's house to talk the family through what they knew so far. When the police were called on the night of the 25th of September, the quiet road was cordoned off. The police moved quickly as this shocking crime rocked the community. All eyes turned to Sally Ann's ex-boyfriend, Lewis. Lewis recounted the last moments he spent with her, saying, I went to get into the car again, but she didn't want me to, and she grabbed my t-shirt, ripping my chain from my neck. After a couple of minutes, I got back into the car and locked the doors. Sally Ann picked up her handbag and I saw her walking away through the rearview mirror. The last thing I saw of Sally Ann was her entering her front garden. Lewis was arrested on the 26th of September, the following day. He was the last person to have seen her alive, and they had been fighting. His ripped shirt and broken necklace could very well be seen as signs of Sally Ann defending herself. His phone record showed him threatening to spit in her face if she'd been with another man earlier that evening. However, something wasn't quite adding up. There were no witnesses. There was no CCTV. They only had one piece of evidence on their side. The killer had left his DNA. The autopsy was performed quickly. Sally Ann had been jabbed with a sharp implement many, many times. 
but shockingly she had also been bitten. Bite marks were found on her neck, chest and cheek. Boyfriend Lewis's DNA wasn't a match and he was released four days later without charge. The case was going cold. If Lewis wasn't responsible for ending Sally Ann, then who was? That fateful night in September had been a night out for many in the Croydon area. While Sally Ann drank in Lloyd's Bar, another celebration was happening two miles down the road. Mark Dixie had just turned 35. He was a chef and had spent the night celebrating with friends at the Windsor Castle pub. It was a heavy night of drinking and he eventually left the pub at around 2.30am, then returning to an after party on Avondale Road where he was left on the sofa downstairs, seemingly alone for the rest of the night. Nine Nine months later, in June 2006, Mark Dixie was arrested following a bar brawl in Crawley. The England football team were playing. A lot of people were drunk. Things got out of hand and punches were thrown. The police were subsequently called. Police took DNA samples from everyone involved as they were taken into custody. It was only a minor assault. So when Mark Dixie began to sob as the custody officers checked him in, the officers were slightly confused bemused even. But the reason for his emotional outburst was a sinister one and it would soon become apparent to everyone. It took two further weeks for Mark Dix's DNA sample to make its way through the system. These things just took longer back then. And shockingly, when the results finally came back, it was an exact match for the DNA found on Sally Ann Bowman. Mark Dixie was arrested on the 28th of June 2006. He pleaded not guilty and he went on trial at the Old Bailey in February 2008. During the trial, the jury heard how Dixie had indeed gone back to her house on Avondale Road on that fateful night. Three weeks before Sally Ann's ending, Dixie was thrown out of his home he shared with his girlfriend and son. And on this very night, Dixie had tried to convince his girlfriend to take him back, but she refused. He had truly slept on the couch at his friend's house, but he had awoken in the early hours. He locked his friends in their bedroom so they wouldn't realise he'd left and then he exited through the front door. Whether he stumbled upon Sally by chance or he had set out to commit a heinous crime, we'll never know. He told the court that he had violated Sally Ann, finding her unconscious. He claimed he was not responsible for her passing, but that he had taken advantage of the situation. He said that he only realised she wasn't alive when he bit her cheek. This defence was far-fetched, but it was the only one that he had. In my opinion, opinion, a totally shameless reach for an excuse to try and minimise what he did. He was relying on the fact that Sally Ann had gotten into a fight with Lewis before she passed, but the jury didn't believe him. It was also revealed that this wasn't Mark Dixie's first offence. It wasn't even his second. It was his 17th. When he was just 16, he violated a woman in her own car before tying her to the door and setting fire to the vehicle. Luckily, she escaped. Mark then went on to commit multiple crimes. In 1998, Dixie threatened a student in Australia with a bladed weapon before bludgeoning her. She survived to tell a tale and Dixie got off scot-free. Strangely, confusingly, he wasn't imprisoned. He wasn't placed on a register. Instead, he was ordered order to pay a fine and then deported. A decision by Australian authorities that haunts Sally Ann's mum. She said, we now know he was arrested at least three times in Australia, but he was deported without any warnings being issued by the authorities. They didn't do their job properly and that is the reason my daughter's dead. The courts in the UK were less forgiving than Australia. Detective Superintendent Cundy said after the trial, the public is protected from a truly dangerous killer. Sally Ann was a young woman who had her whole life ahead of her. Mark Dick 
Dixie cut that life short in the most horrific way imaginable. On the 22nd of February 2008, he was found guilty after just three hours of deliberation by the jury. He was sentenced to a minimum of 34 years in prison, one of the longest minimum terms handed out in the United Kingdom at that time. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew, you too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons, your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So a huge thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Krogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebronek, and Darlene. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.